This is Between Classes, a Kurtuba Islamic Academy production. Coming up in this episode. I was that one who the parents would say stay at home and I just never want to stay at home. I wanted to be out. I used to get good marks coming out first and second in school was like normal in us if ever we came out third you became sad. And I even remember the principal of the school came to say that and he was a non-muslim. So he called my brother he said I don't know what this alim cause is what your father is telling me but I'm asking you one favor finish my trick. From your children Allah also wants his zakat to be taken. There's three sentences although the journey was about 2 and a half years ago. The one where the young boy said on behalf of the people of Syria jazakum Allah hasan al jaza. The other one he said shahada ya sir. Shahada means martyrdom but it means an honor for Allah. But you cry. And the third one when he said don't take away the izzat of the poor people. And then he said and there's no way. The amazing history changes with the writer. Who was my hero yesterday today I learned he's my liar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum to all our listeners welcome to another session another episode of between classes by QIA alhamdulillah thum alhamdulillah today we are extremely fortunate to have with us a scholar a mentor a spiritual guide to many an orator a caregiver and a leader in Maulana Ridwan Kaji salam barakatuh Maulana welcome to Qurtuba Islamic Academy and to another episode of Between Classes by QIA. Today I am joined by Salman Ali, a learner in the grade 11 class who will join me in this interview with Hazrat Maulana Ridwan Kaji Sahib inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah we are blessed with Maulana. And Maulana we just want to ask you a few questions. Uh, could Maulana please tell us about Maulana's background and his upbringing where Maulana grew up and what the point of time Maulana commenced hadith and what serve as a factor of motivation behind this where Mulana pursued his alim and what madrasa opts for this Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah I will mention to you one point that happened in my life which perhaps there was a time when one ustad of mine asked that what do you think was the reason for yourself my elder brother my younger brother all coming to the madrasa despite my father being a doctor and my father at the initial stage of his life not having so much of relationship with scholars with ulama so at that time what came to my mind was that although my father himself was not a scholar and at that time he was not a very learned man in the islamic sciences but allah tabaarak wa taala blessed him with a unique love he adored the scholars the ulama he had lot of respect for them I remember that whenever there was a need to take a certain alim to the masjid so my father when he was driving then he would drive the alim he would always go to pick him up but the time came when I wanted to start driving so if I'm in the driver's seat and my father is in the seat next to me and then as we passing by and the alim is on the road waiting for the left to go to the masjid then it was a simple issue of just stopping the car and for the alim to get into the back My father would never allow this however. He would get out and he would make sure the alim would sit in the front. I would feel it's such a long procedure the sir every time that you take in the is this we going to the masjid around the corner. But he could not ever accept that his back can be facing the head of an alim. So he would get out, he would come and sit in the back, he would make sure the alim would sit in the front. The only thing I really feel my background my upbringing is not something really to be mentioned the things i can remember when i was young was many a time i was in wrong company and i can remember my father would always shout me and say that you are in this company you're going to get their bad habits and i could never understand why he was stopping me from the company 
It's today when I think about that in that company, it is only the kindness of Allah that He protected me from falling into the habits of that company. But I used to enjoy company of not the best of boys. I was that one who the parents would say, stay at home and I just never want to stay at home. I wanted to be out. I wanted to be going for soccer. I wanted to be going to play with my friends. Wherever someone was going, my question was, why can't I be with them? So there's nothing much to mention about really like what was my upbringing. It wasn't the best. In the fact that my parents tried hard, but I never played the game fully. What however I feel gave me a lot of protection from the side of Almighty Allah was perhaps that my father showed respect to the ulama. In respect of that, in honor of that, it seems Allah Taala put a protective veil. May Allah keep that veil over us all. Mm-hmm. It fell over my elder brother, it fell over me, it fell over my younger brother. It prevented us falling into those things and mistakes which became addictive, which we could never later on come out of. There was no thought of me becoming an alim, my brother becoming an alim. This word alim we never knew. We all had our thoughts about maybe my father was a doctor, my brother was well in his studies. He used to get good marks. I used to get good marks. Coming out first and second in school was like normal in us. If ever we came out third, you became sad. So you expect that now because we're getting the best grades, you are going to have a very unique future. But then my brother reached that last level. Now I don't know what you call it, but at that time it was known that year before matric. And at that time his heart just changed and he decided now to go to madrasa. He had met Hazrat Mawlana Abdul Hamid Sahib Dhamud Barakatu. A certain inclination was formed. We never even know like there's a choice. There's Darulum Zakaria, Azadwal, Springs. At that time we knew nothing of madrasas. We never know what is Azadwal, what is a Darulum. So it's not something we studied. It was just a certain thought and what a time the thought came. Again, this I feel was that because my father showed honor to the people of knowledge, Allah was going to force us in this direction. So suddenly his mind changed and now in his one year left for his matrik, he decides to say, I'm going out. And I even remember the principal of the school came to say that, and he was a non-Muslim. So he called my brother, he said, I don't know what this alim cause is, what your father is telling me, but I'm asking you one favor, finish matric. He says, get the certificate in life whenever you need it. And my brother is saying, no way. And if someone has to ask, like what spurred him so much, it will be that when Allah Taala pushes you in a direction, you can't pull back. So suddenly he went to madrasa. And there was now no thought of me going to madrasa. It was never in our mind. And then the next year, Hazrat Mufti Mahmoud Sab, Rahimullah passed away in South Africa. My father heard someone is going for the janaza. I also went. I never even knew like who Mufti Sab was, whose janaza we going to. We went for the janaza. I was amazed. What a huge janaza. After the janaza, Hazrat Mawlana Abdul Hamid Sab Dhamad Barakatu met my father. And then he asked my father, what am I doing? And he explained that I'll be doing this. And then for some reason, he made my father's tashkil day and day. That one son is in the madrasa, why don't you send the second son? For my mother, it was like a double shock now. She lost the one brother, one son, and she never thought the other one is going, and suddenly the house became like a qabristan, quiet. What pushed me in that direction? What pushed my brother in that direction? Who knows? Respect that my father showed for the ulama. And one other thing which later on my father one day said, when my third brother decided to become an alim, so now you've got three sons in the house. There's no daughters. There's nobody else. The whole house is empty. All are becoming alims. So at that time, my father said he remembers many, many years ago when a great scholar of the world, which was known as Hazrat Haji Farooq Sahib came to South Africa. So my father used to take one alim for the majlis. I used to also sometimes go, but I never understood Urdu. I used to just sit, wait for the translation and I knew after the bayan, there'll be example savories and I like the savories. So I would go for that, the milkshake, the samosa. I never really understood what is all of this. But my father says he remembers that one majlis of Hazrat Haji Farooq Sahib Rahimullah when he said this. He said, just like how Allah has made that from your wealth, you have to take out zakat. And if you take out a little zakat of your wealth, it will look after all your wealth. He says, similarly from your children, Allah also wants a zakat to be taken out. So if Allah blesses a person with three, four children, 
He must say at least one child I am taking out for the deen of Allah. He says if one child comes out work for Allah, he will look after all the other children. He will see to their deen, he will see to their dunya, he will see to their masail. He will show them the way towards bent salvation in this world, in the akhirah. He says, I'm only asking you to take out one son. My father sitting in that gathering, and this is from Allah's side, he sometimes makes a person say something which later on he only thinks, what did I say? So in that gathering, he's saying to himself that why only one son? Allah, I'll send all my sons to you. So he said it at a time when everyone was young and he forgot about it. But because he said it at that time, I make all my children work for your deen. It was written by Allah. After that, no matter how much of emphasis was put that can you become something else, it was already written that your children have to be work for you. So we could not go into business. Those were like shut for us. We could not go into any other studies. There was only one that when this person has been made work, you can't take the child back. Whoever is listening, I ask you also. May Allah inspire all. If you can't make this intention that I make all my children work for the deen of Allah, at least so much you can say. That oh Allah, if you bless me with children, I promise at least one child will be work for your deen. Make the intention today and tomorrow you will see miracles. And the second, how much of respect you can show for the people of knowledge. In the honor of that Almighty Allah will make sure the knowledge of Islam will always come into your houses. Jazakallah, Masa. What beautiful advices and story behind Mulana's journey towards learning. Masa, I make this intention now that inshallah all three of my sons and my daughter also become work for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, once again, listeners, we see the benefit of respect for our elders, for our parents, and the duas of a parent. We seen this last week when we had a guest, Afan, the boy that was a miracle of the Quran, that his parents' duas gave him the ability to memorize the Quran, yet he cannot read the Quran. Molana, which town did Molana hail from? Where's Molana originally from? When we were small, uh, from Whitbank, there were some riots taking place. This also is Allah's unique system. In Whitbank, we were living in the center of a location. Because you're living in the center of a location, my father being a doctor, this was very profitable business. And because your patients are all around you, you are at the center. And then there were some riots that took place. The most I can remember of it is I was in the room changing and one brick came through the window, the glass broke. That's all I can remember. My father pulled me out of the room. Thereafter, my father made the decision, we're leaving immediately. It is not an easy thing to pack up and go. And then he, for a while, he put us somewhere else and he went. It happened that the place that he found and later on, first it was Richmond, I think. And then we came to Heidelberg. It was never going to give so much of monetary benefit. And this my father later on would explain to me, like what Winbank would get. He said for him to move from Whitbank at that time was so difficult because he called it like this was a mine, a gold mine. You were surrounded by your customers. You're living in the center of them. And when he had to make the move now, although he found still a good profit, but he was not finding the gold mine anymore. But as we came into Heidelberg, one change that happened was Heidelberg was very close to Nigel. And because of Nigel being the place where the Khulafa of Hazrat Murana Masullah Rahmatullah would come, that is where he started going to these majalis. So our entire deen started when that move had to take place. Had we remained in Whitbank, perhaps there would have been a gold mine. Perhaps I would have been flying in the sky. I would have had my own personal jet. But maybe my chance of finding the Quran and the deen of Almighty Allah would never have come. Because of this move, from that I also learned one lesson, which Quran mentions so beautifully. Asa an takrahu shay'a. There will be many times when you will dislike a certain thing. Wa huwa khayrun lakum. But in that very thing, Allah has put all your happiness, all your goodness. In life, you will find sometimes a question in you, why? And you will see something being taken away from you, what you want. I have a lot of yaqeen, tawakkul in Allah, that my Allah never takes away except that he wants to give something better. And we found this. So we grew up in Heidelberg. And in Heidelberg, we had the honor of being surrounded by many, many scholars. 
Our neighbor had just come back from Zambia. He was a famous scholar in Zambia, Marana Mansoor. He spoke Urdu, Gujarati. I never knew Urdu, Gujarati. But I used to go to him. I started my hues by him. I would never understand everything that he would say, but little but I would get an understanding. But it was that environment, that company. Then there was my famous Ustad, Marana Ismail Bismillah. He loved, he was from Jalalabad, he loved the ulama of Jalalabad. So whenever any of the scholars came, he made sure we would go. And this became the reasons of our inclination towards the people of piety changing to a certain extent. It was all the move towards Hyderabad. Inshallah, Mosab, we'll enjoy our own private chats together in Jannah, inshallah. On that note, Mosab, having journeyed across the globe, is there any country that Molana's traveled to that has left a lasting impression of Molana? And if Molana could elaborate, that what was the particular standout about that country? Two countries I really, really enjoyed. One was when I journeyed into what we call the borders of Turkey, which is actually known as in the real world Sham, although they call it Turkey. It is the same place where perhaps part of the earthquake that recently affected. So a year or two years before the earthquake with a group of friends, we went there on a journey on a mission of three, four days. Those people had taken their own zakat money. They gave me the chance to accompany them. Facilities were made by some Muslim organizations and it became easy now to go and distribute. So we went there and then Allah gave us a chance also to go over the border. It was the chance to meet people, children whose fathers, parents had been made martyr during the attack on Syria by the regime of Bashar al-Assad. We went in these orphanages Normally, I do not like to go to any sad place. Even if someone passes away, I say, please, if they can be smiling, it makes me feel. I don't like to see someone sad. On this journey, I was a little bit apprehensive that I don't like to see sad faces. I'm going to see these boys who saw their parents butchered in front of them. But amazing it was that whatever age of children we saw, we only found people who are full of love. They're running behind. There were many who were speaking, who never knew the Arabic language, but the way these boys connected. So I will give you one or two examples of this. We took these boys, it was the month of Ramadan. We took the whole orphanage out for an iftar. So we came to the iftar about half an hour, 45 minutes earlier, because to gather all of them in this restaurant to feed them. To see people so excited, today we're getting a meal in the restaurant. Where we and you can eat any day, anywhere. For these boys in our orphanage, one was the food. The second thing is there's no men around them, no men. Because of which, when a man comes, they get so happy like, you like my father, you my brother, they just hold on to you. So there's one young boy, perhaps he's seven years, eight years old. He's supposed to be sitting with all the other orphans, but he came to where we were. And he asked me, because I know little Arabic, he was able to converse, the others never know so much. So he asked me, the chef, will you mind if I sit next to you? Like, so I could see the person, the head of it is trying to tell him that, no, you go sit where you're supposed to sit. And I said, no, we'll be too happy. Like we can ask him questions. So he sat so mature, but he's only about seven, eight, nine years old. I don't know what his age. I only think it's seven. So one person said, ask him like, uh, does he remember anything of his father? That's not the best question to ask. I never want to ask him that question. Like, why do you take the person? But he understood a little bit. So he asked, what did the man say? So I said, no, he's just asking, you remember your father? So he says, not only I remember my father, I remember the time they murdered my father. He says, I remember seeing my father and my uncle in that hole. We went looking for him at night. He said, I remember all of that. And I remember we pulled out the bodies. So as he said that now, it's still, if, still fasting time, not even iftar. I wasn't too happy with the question. So already as he started saying it, we started cheering. The person in front of me started cheering. I started cheering. So this young boy then looks at us shocked like, and he says, Sheikh, why are you crying? And what a sentence he said, it was shahada. Shahada means martyrdom and honor from Allah. Now for us to cry, we don't even know the boy's father. But for him to be telling us, what are you crying for? He said, shahada. For such a young boy to be able to say that, that day still remains the way he told me, shahada. The second is as we were distributing, in one place, giving out those boxes. So one young boy comes behind me. And then he asks me, like, where you all came from? So I say, South Africa. I say, what brought you all here? Like, why you all came? Do you all know us? 
So then I said, no, just the love that you are a Muslim friend. So what a sentence this boy said, when a young boy speaks with so much of maturity, you understand that those people who don't have elders, they become elders themselves. So the boy said something, maybe his mother sent him because the women are in hijab now, but they want to thank, but they don't know how to thank. But a young boy to come and thank, he says, on behalf of the people of Syria, I say to you, South Africans, Jazakumullah, Hassan al Jazak. So the sentence was so simple, but the way he said it, and that age for someone to say, I thank you because there's no father to thank. So I'm like the father of the town and I thank you on behalf of all. And the third one was, we enter one container. So my friend who's running this entire mission recently in the earthquake, many of his family, I heard about 19 of his family members also passed away. He said, imagine what it is pulling out 19 of your family members from the rubble. You left with no one. He had left Syria at that time and he came away to Turkey with his family. He had seen many of his family martyred there. Then living in Turkey and then he saw 19 of his close family members. I don't know who's left, but it's not easy. But still you will see this person always smiling, always smiling. So he took me into one container. We got very close in those few days. So he said, see what you think this container. Before I explain to you the container, you tell me what is this container. So I looked at it and I understood it's clothing. It's clothing for the orphans, it's clothing for the widows. So he says, why do you think we put up this container? He says, when the war took place, many of these people reached here in tents. He took me to the tent. There's no place in the tent to hang clothing. I asked him, so where they hang their clothing? So he laughed. He said, there's no need to hang clothing because you only got one cloth. When these people ran away, they got no clothing. So they're not hanging, they sleep with the same thing, they wake up with the same thing. He said, then later on, we get ability, we move 10, 10, it goes better, better, better. So he says, now people of the world started sending their clothing. So we landed up with a lot of old clothing, old clothing. And now we started distributing it amongst these people. And we realized that number one, sizes don't fit. And he says, who likes their own child to wear somebody else's old socks? So he said, instead of that, we started saying, why don't money come? And with money, we can make new clothing. So he said, we put up this container. He said, you know what this container is? It is the window for these mothers. So we go to this with this container to the different areas and then the parents have to come, the mothers. They must come with their sons, their daughters. And then the mother will first look at what we got in store. Like this is our abaya, this is our jubbas, this is our clothing, this is our shoes. And she will choose what pattern she wants. And then we'll have our tailors taking her measurements. So that twice a year, we can give this mother brand new clothing. Then she takes her children into the children's section. Then they choose what shoe they like, what socks they like. So I said, what an idea this was. He says, why we had this idea? We understood one thing. Even if a person is poor, their honor and their izzat is still there. He said, don't take away that izzat of this. He said, you know how happy they get when they get brand new. Then he asked me one question. He said, you saw the woman's section. He said, you saw the children's section, what's missing? Do you haven't got a question? So I said, no. He said, ask me the question, why is the men's section so small? The women's section was huge. The children's section was huge, so much. Why the men's section is so small? So I never know like what to say. I said, maybe a lot of men don't come. He said, there are no men. He said, there are no men. He said, all the men were martyred. So we got such a small section for men, just that sentence. So these three sentences, although the journey was about two and a half years ago, the one where the young boy said, on behalf of the people of Syria, Jazakumullah, Hassan al Jazak. The other one where he said, Shahada ya Shah. Shahada means martyrdom, but it means an honor from Allah. What you cry. And the third one when he said, don't take away the izzat of the poor people. And then he said, and there's no men. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, myself, I also had the good opportunity to visit uh, the lands of Syria on a relief mission as well. And I won't forget a, a incident out of the many that we also witnessed that when we got off at one refugee camp, there were some youngsters sitting on this, in the sand. And we went to them and we found one youngster playing with the page holder on the liver arch fire. You know, the thing that holds the places down, the pages down. And he was just pressing this from side to side and making a noise. So my Ustad, my Bilal Vaid, that was with us, he asked this youngster, what is this? Youngster never even know. He never know what it was. It was a toy for him. 
Ah. And our kids, alhamdulillah, we're so fortunate. What in what we have here in our country and at our homes, these youngsters sit in the middle of the desert with just one lever arch file page holder, and that was his toy. You know, I urge our listeners that if you get the opportunity to go out and visit poor people, whether it's in South Africa or overseas, it's a real eye opener. Once When I came back from the journey, I did mention this to people that I don't know whether they benefited more from us coming or mm. we benefited. See, see. Every person, there's a word in the Arabic language, "ni'am al-amir ala bab al-faqir." Most amazing is that wealthy person who goes to the door of the poor person. Allah grant all the chances. Amen, amen. Alhamdulillah, Mustafa, you had a great opportunity of sitting in the company of numerous great scholars. Would it be possible for Molana to impart information about some of Molana's esteemed mentors and the notable qualities that Molana has acquired through Molana's teachers and the scholars? Very quickly, I'll give you one example. I was fortunate, me and my brother, because of Hazrat Molana Abdul Hamid Sahib Dhamul Barakatu, from because from who we benefit immensely. When we graduated, Hazrat Maulana gave us the chance to go travel to Pakistan. This was the time when Hazrat Shah Hakim Muhammad Akhtar Sahib was already paralyzed. And Hazrat Maulana made a little bit sifarish for us that Hazrat Hakim Sahib must give us a little extra time. So we really benefited. We had four months in the company of Hazrat Hakim Sahib where we used to be in, in his majalis. But then we used to go in his room when there was no one there. At times it was only me and my brother and one khadim making khidmat of him and really during those days, especially in the times when he used to allow people to come visit him, have a cup of tea, what we would see was like amazing. So I can tell you one incident that still sits in my mind. Because he was paralyzed now and his body had become such, he would now never enter the masjid. Even if he had to give a lecture, he would do it outside the masjid because of the urine bag. He never felt it right to go in the masjid, which I found many people now when that thing happens, they go in a depression. That I used to do so much before. He used to do. He used to travel the world in the love of Allah. Now p- paralysis made it such that traveling became very difficult for him. But he was never shy. This was the unique thing of his. Even sickness, difficulty did not create that shyness in him. What we call depression. When he made when he was still traveling in aeroplane, it was difficult. But he would laugh about this. So he had a urine bag. And you have your bottle with you with the khadim. And for a normal person, it will be very like, I'm ashamed now. Like I have to like urinate in a bottle. And sometimes the urine might come out like while I'm sitting, I can't even get to the bathroom because my body doesn't allow it. He was never ashamed of anything. He said, whatever is the condition Allah loves to see me in. He said, I, Akhtar, I'm happy to be in that condition no matter how hard. But to see a practical example of the seer. So, when, so while he was in the aeroplane, he needed to urinate. So he told his khadim, put the bottle there. He used to have lungi. So they put the bottle under the lungi. He said at that time, the person of the aeroplane was walking past. So he saw a little bit. So he asked, sir, you need some help. Like, so smiling, like he told the person, tell him that, you know, at the moment I'm involved in very, very important work. Like, give me five minutes. Because this is like very important work and he started laughing now. Now who will ever laugh about such? You normally will feel shy like. But later on he called the person and he said, you know, I was busy with like most important work. You know what important work? The man was like shocked. What important work? Like? And he said, this, there's no more work important than this here. Like, this is most important. And that man started laughing. He started laughing. When I'm hearing that incident, I said, have you ever seen a person that in that condition could also make it a joke? So when Alim came from the far areas of Pakistan to come and visit him, it took him a while. So we were there sitting when this Alim came in the room. This Alim had traveled all the way to come and tell Hazrat Hakim Sahib that, you know what, Allah put you in this condition now. It is best, Allah knows best. Why I'm saying this here is sometimes in life you will see someone pass away, you will see someone close to you, you go in your depression. If anyone had the right to go in depression, it would have been this individual. When that Alim came, In that 15, 20 minutes, he sat there. Hazrat Kim Sahib loved jokes, loved laughing. Sometimes he would laugh so much, he would start crying. So someone said a joke and he said a joke and everyone was laughing. Everyone is laughing, but this Alim here, you can see because it is first time coming, he was like stunned. So he's not laughing. 15 minutes later, 20 minutes, he asked permission to go. Then he said something. He said, you know, I traveled from so far. I thought I must come and tell you, you know, make sabr. But I see you don't need any encouragement. Like you like more happier than the world. 
And then he said this, he said, you know me, because of running my madrasa, I got so much tension. In this 15 minutes in your company, all that tension went down. So I said, instead of coming to give you like the silly and tell you, don't worry, make sabr, you gave me like. And Hazrat Rakim Sahib laughed and then Hazrat Rakim Sahib said that, see, what is the highest place that every one of us is trying to reach? It was to be happy with every decision of Allah with a happy face. Mm. That one day, that lesson, that whatever will come in life, it might be difficult on my body. But he used to love the sentence. He says, Akhtar is happy with that which makes you Allah happy. Akhtar is happy with that which makes you Allah happy. Allah bless us all with that high level to be happy with the decision of Allah mm. with a happy face. Amen. But our Kabirin and pious predecessors had so many great qualities within them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instill the love for them in our hearts and bless us with the qualities that they embodied. Mulana's reputation for possessing a profound understanding of history is widely acknowledged. What is instilled this passion for history within Mulana? And what step did Mulana take to cultivate and nurture this? I don't know why I was so interested in history. And I don't know whether I'm interested in that history which the world normally knows. There's a law in Quran which Allah says that indeed we have narrated to you the incidents of the past so that the people of intelligence can take ibrat. What this verse means is history repeats itself. The plots of the devil of the past will be the same plots of the future. And the way the people of the past survived will be the same way they'll survive in the future. Wherever you will go in the world, if you know a little of history, but which history? That's why when Quran speaks about the incident of Musa alayhi salam, Allah tabarukullah says, we will tell you about Musa. And then Allah tabarukullah says, but we'll tell you the true story. That word bil haqqi, the true story was to say, remember majority of history is a lie. If your interest is in history and what is called history taught by the modern world, then you're not going to go very far with your understanding of history. If your understanding of history is history based on the Quran and on the Sunnah, it will give you that eye that you will see the lies in what is known as the modern day written history. When I was in school, I don't know your history books change now. When we were in school, we learned of Shaka Zulu and we learned of Dingan. At that time, however, because it was still the white man rule. So Shaka Zulu was the hero. He killed the lion with his hands. He was the man and Dingan was the traitor. Dingan got Shaka Zulu killed after that. So we just hated Dingan. We loved Shaka Zulu. Later on when my somebody else was in school, I had a chance to look at their history book. Today I don't know what the story is. It changes with the days. But then I'm saying in the history book the story changed. That Shaka Zulu wanted to sell the lands of the black man to the white man. Dingan wanted to stop him. Finally, Dingan was able to kill Shaka Zulu, but then the white man killed Dingan. Dingan is the hero, not Shaka Zulu. I'm looking at the two and I say, amazing history changes with the writer. Who was my hero yesterday, today I learned he's my liar. When I went to Turkey, I saw the statue of Mustafa Kamal. In the park they have it, he's like sitting. There was a time where young children would run onto the statue just to be able to sit in the lap of Mustafa Kamal. Whereas Mustafa Kamal was the man who raped the city of Istanbul from Islam. The name was Islambul, the city of Islam. He took away Islam. He changed the name. He took away the Arabic language. He took away the knowledge of Quran. He took away the modesty. Today the people are realizing he wasn't a good man. But history, history makes you make heroes of people who are villains. If you are interested in history, start with the history of true Quran and Sunnah. And thereafter, you will see the lies in what is known as the modern day history. We now reach that time where there's something called the alternative <laughs> view. A few years ago, there wasn't that. That alternative view gives you an understanding of how many other stories there are. And one is the normal story. In this, I learned one thing. Whenever the media from all sides will say the same thing, history has taught us don't ever believe it. When the media from all sides unite on one story, you must understand the story was made up. Otherwise in the world, no one unites on anything. Then your eye will start looking at there must be something behind the story. And that is how history, which Allah says, Ibaratan li ulil albab. There will be unique lessons for the people who's ready to put their mind to it. 
Allah tabarak ta'ala bless us all with that eye that we are able to see it through the lies of the modern day written history and we are able to take lessons for our future also. Jazakallah, Masaf, Jazakallah. One final request to Maulana is, and more so for our learners, if Maulana could give us one parting advice and for our learners, more so some career guidance, what would Maulana say? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned this year to a jamaat of people around him who were going to become the leaders of humanity. He said it to people who were shepherds. Their only job was looking after goats and sheep. But Allah's Nabi sallallahu understood in the next few years, as soon as he was going to pass away, there was no shepherds left. Each one of them was going to be what you can call today the mayor, the wali, the governor, the qadi. They were going to be making decisions upon the vast majority. They were going to be getting so much of wealth in their houses. They were going to be distributors of wealth. Their life was going to change what we say in a five year. They were going to become from zero to hero. Now you're giving exa- advice to such a person. So example, you got a career, you're going to become someone, but definitely you will never be able to become who they became. They became like the governors, the wali, the president of a country. Whereas just yesterday, they never even have a house to look after. One unique sentence he said to them, he said, Al-Khalqu Iyalullah. The entire creation is the household of Almighty Allah. فَأَحَبُّ الْخَلْقِ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَنْ أَحْسَنَ إِلَىٰ عِيَالِهِ He said, the one that is most beloved to Almighty Allah will be the one who will show the highest level of kindness to the household of Allah. The sentence that he put in the hearts of his Sahaba was that in this world, if the purpose is to make money, then Fir'aun made money, Qarun made money. If the person is to have a name and fame, then there were people in the past who the world knew and the world forgot. And if the purpose of the world is to get the world so you can give it to those who don't have it, then really you have grabbed the world. This is the household of Allah, everyone in front of you. Whatever you are going to become in life, let the main purpose behind it, underlining purpose be, I want to be the khadim, the servant of Allah's household. In that I will be the most beloved in the household. You got only 60 years, 70 years. In that 70 years, 20 years, take out 30 years for studying. And you take out another 10 years at the ending when you get old and you want to retire. You will see you're only sitting with about 25, 30 years. In those 25, 30 years, you can either make it for yourself. But if you make it for yourself, then when you're going to go in your cupboard, you're going with zero. And if you say, this 30 years, I want to be the one who can serve humanity at large. Which Quran mentions, who will give life to one person? He will be given the reward as though he gave life to the entire world. You must make an intention, whether you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a psychiatrist, a teacher, whatever you want, money is going to come. It's part, if you have the cow and you say, I got the cow for milk, you say, that's what the cow is for. If the man says, no, I got the cow for the fodder, you say, that's the dirt of the cow. That comes with the cow. That's natural. It's a byproduct. Don't intend that. If your intention is, I need to become wealthy. Wealth comes with every profession. Wealth is definitely going to come even if you got no profession. But the chance to be the khadim of the creation of Allah, that comes to the one who asks Allah, will you allow me to be? I saw doctors whose desire was just to get more and more wealthy. In that, when they had to sign papers for the patient, the patient at that moment is at such a low level. The child is sick, the patient is ready to do anything. The patient got no money, but the doctor got no heart. So the doctor says, then do this test, and do this test, and do this test. And the doctor is also taking his high fee, and then he's taking, I saw those doctors. And I saw those doctors when the patient comes, and the patient is looking so worried, it's going to be expensive. And the doctor in his mind is already thinking that, you know, these tests I'm going to pay for for myself. When the patient will go there and the patient will ask, like, what's the amount? And they'll say, no, don't worry, the doctor sorted it out. That amount of du'as that mother at that moment, that father will give. Because at the moment they're in such a spot, their child is sick. They haven't got that amount, but this doctor made an intention while he was studying. That if I become a good doctor, money will continue coming. But can I use that money on my patients? That person who becomes a lawyer, that person who becomes a teacher, you can intend I need to pull, I need to squeeze, I need to take the blood of the world. Or you can say I need to give blood. I need to give water. I need to give aid. The amount of du'as you will get when you will make the khidmat of someone, you won't have to tell the person make du'a. That person while sleeping also, 
naturally duas will come out. And even if he makes no dua, she makes no dua. Allah Tabarakul said, the most beloved to Allah is the one who will show kindness to the household of Almighty Allah. In your career, when you're making a choice, say the underlining purpose of my life mission is to serve the creation of Almighty Allah. And while serving them, to be able to win them, bring them closer to the deen of Allah. Allah Tabarakul grant all of us that tawfiq. Amen. Amen. We'd like to thank Mulana for blessing us with these invaluable advices. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to make amal and practice upon every one of them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our learners for the khidmah with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may use them for the deen till the day the last breath is taken. Jazakum al khair wa ahsan al jazah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa We could not have made this audio adventure possible without the incredible contribution of Maulana Aslam Raja, Appa Amira Hajjat, and the brilliant minds of the Kurtuba Islamic Academy podcast team. Remember to hit the subscribe button and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. This has been a Kurtuba Islamic Academy podcast.